International Community of Women Living with HIV. And it is my great pleasure um, to introduce Malaya Harper, um, who is currently the chief of the UNAIDS Gender, Diversity, and Equality Department. Um, she has a long history of activism, and I will, uh, everyone or many of you will have a bio sheet, um, which can go into some more detail about um, her excellent work um, for UNAIDS and beyond. Um, and without further ado, I will let her take it away for this exciting and dynamic uh, dialogue. Here. Um, thank you, Sophie, and good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, wonderful um, to see such a packed uh, room on this very, very important uh, topic, which gets to really the heart of uh, human dignity and, and human rights. I do have a gavel. I'm not sure why, but I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> um, and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you here. So forced and coerced sterilization is a fundamental human rights violation and a gross violation of human dignity. And for ourselves at UNAIDS, who I work for currently, it speaks to the heart of the values and the principles of our work. And it's really one of many human rights violations uh, in the realm of sexual and reproductive rights violations. So all of us gathered here today um, understand that sterilization is actually one of the most common forms of contraception and an, op an important option for individuals who are given a choice to control their fertility. But the pertinent word in this is option. The freedom to decide one's own sexual and reproductive health and live with full rights and dignity. And this includes full, free and informed consent of individuals who can decide uh, on whether to be sterilized or not. And too often, as we know and as we'll hear from the panel, this is not uh, the case. Fortunately, as we've seen in the last few years, this abhorrent practice has been gaining international attention. And I think a number of us in the room followed uh, what happened in Namibia. And we have a similar court case now going on in Kenya. So advocacy, attention, international attention is being gained. But I think what we want to be able to do is collectively work together to be able to stop the practice. Attention and advocacy only get us so far. So we're also getting um, increased commitment uh, the, as reflected in the 2011 commitment by FIGO on the guidelines for female contraceptive sterilization, which protects the rights of women to access sterilization while stressing the need to ensure their free and fully informed consent. Also in 2013, the Africa Commission on Human and People Rights Resolution on Involuntary Sterilization which affirm that all forms of involuntary sterilization are a violation of a number of rights enshrined in the African Charter and the Maputo Protocol. The recent Supreme Court decision in Namibia, which I've already mentioned. Uh, and so with a lot of international support and a lot of commitment and mobilization around the issue, but this isn't enough. And in this panel, we'll hear specifically about practices and experience. And we'll, we're going to run this panel a little bit like Davos style. We only have one hour and 15 minutes, so we'll be focusing targeted questions at the panel. From the audience, if you have a question, what we'll be doing is handing out cards. And Sophie will be collecting the cards so that we can group the questions and to the panel. And I think this is probably a fairer way to make sure that all the sets of related questions are addressed. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists uh, today. And I'll start here on my left. Teresia Joki Otieno is a member of the International Steering Committee of the International Community of Women Living with HIV, ICW, to many of you. She's an accomplished advocate for women living with HIV 
and most recently has worked in partnership with the African Gender and Media Initiative, GEM, to document experiences of women living with HIV on forced and coerced sterilization. Thank you, Tricia, for joining us. Eustace Esfeld, did I pronounce it correctly this time? Good enough. Good enough, okay. <laughs> Is a trans man, co-founder and co-director of GATE, the Global Action for Trans Equality, and the focus of his work is on funding for trans communities worldwide and, the glo and global HIV policy. Eustace provided technical support for the development of the UN interagency statement that I mentioned, I didn't mention it, but in my introductory remarks, I should have mentioned that the UN now has a common position and a statement on this practice. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Andrea Para is the director of the Action Program for Equality and Social Inclusion, a human rights law cl clinic in Bogota, Colombia, that engages in legal and political advocacy against discrimination based on disability, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Dr. Camila Gianelli, Janella is a postdoctorate fellow at the Department of Comparative Politics at the University of Bergen and has experience investigating cases regarding sexual and reproductive rights violations before international courts and treaty bodies. Uh, last but not least, Lydia on the end was previously a program officer at the Open Society Foundation. Uh, at, sorry, she was the former campaign manager until 2013 of the campaign to stop torture in healthcare at the Open Society Foundation, which included non-consensual sterilization and led to the publication of key international guidelines on this issue. Um, so I'm going to ask the panelists to limit their um, initial uh, remarks to between three to uh, five minutes, or three minutes I'm being told. I really should give Sophie five minutes. I'll give Sophie the, the gavel. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Teresia. Um, and Teresia, based on your work with ICW documenting cases of forced sterilization, can you tell us about the nature and the impact that forced sterilization has on women living with HIV? Thank you, Malaya, and thank you for inviting me to this session. <clears throat> Since 2005, ICW has exposed cases of forced and coerced sterilization with other networks of women living with HIV. And since then, it has turned out to be a big violations and a global uh, aspect of violating women living with HIV. Cases has been documented in Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, so uh, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and other places in the world. As we speak currently, we have documented cases in over 30 countries worldwide. But what is forced and coerced sterilization? Coerced sterilization is where women living with HIV are made to consent for sterilization even if they don't want, based on either for, the, for them to get support or due to misinformation or because of threats. Forced sterilization is where sterilization is done without the knowledge of the woman, and they come to know of it later. So how does this happen? Most of the time, it does happen when uh, consent is obtained during labor, when women living with HIV present themselves to the health workers for delivery, and then they are told to sign the form, the consent form for sterilization. Other women that we have talked to in the network also were coerced into accepting support. For example, some of the women say that if you don't sign this form, then you're not going to have your bills paid at the hospital. You're not going to have your milk that you're supposed to give the baby. Or we are not going to give you nutritional support that we always give you. And some even had to be told that we are not going to give you drugs in some of the facilities. There is also a lot of misinformation by healthcare workers on the issues of family planning and how many children that women living with HIV should have. And so when women are told that if you give birth, you're going to die, then it, it leaves them in a compromising situation. Women living with HIV who also have disability has faced coerced and forced sterilization. And most of them have been coerced or forced to, to, to sign forms, either through their partners or their spouses, or even through their parents. But the most uh, endearing one is the forced one, where women living with HIV go to the 
uh, theater for Caesarian section, but when they come out, they are already sterilized. When I was giving birth to my second child, and I mentioned this most of the time, when I was being wheeled to the theater, my doctor was busy telling me that she's going to sterilize me. And as a woman living with HIV, there were so many things and fears that were going within my head. I was afraid of going to infect my child. I was even afraid of dying. And so the issues of sterilization was not open in my, in my head, and I could not even say no. So due to that fear and due to other concerns that, were, uh, that I was having then, then I was not able to negotiate and talk to my doctor and say, we need to discuss about this. I need to go and discuss to, with my partner. But true to her word, when I was wheeled back to my bed after cesarean section, the following day she was telling me, sign here because I already sterilized you. To me, that is violation of the greatest order. That is humiliation of the greatest order for women living with HIV. Why? Because we have a right to consent. I can understand what sterilization is. I can even understand that a woman living with HIV should not give birth to so many children and should space them. But I need that information to be given to me, and then I need to be given that opportunity to make informed consent. Like many other women around the world, as I've said, they, who are facing forced and coerced sterilization, it has a lot of impact, uh, Malaya. And one of them is that there is a lot of intimate partner violence. In our African setup, if a woman is not giving birth, then you are seemed to be nothing. And most of them have been chased away from their matrimonial home, thus losing their inheritance and their source of uh, livelihood. One of the other things is that there is a lot of increased... Uh, stigma towards women living with HIV who cannot give birth. And so that and that is like double stigma because you're already HIV positive, you cannot give birth. And I remember one of the women that we were talking to during our usual psychosocial support and documenting the cases of forced and coerced sterilization. She had a child when she was only 20. She was forced and forcefully sterilized. But a year later, the child died, and she was not able to give birth again. So she was chased away from, their, from her matrimonial home. The husband left her, and she's not able to remarry again. We know that we can live even after 20 years with HIV, but without exercising our reproductive health rights. I think it would be difficult for, for women to do that. So a lot of impact, really, for, for women living with HIV who have been sterilized without their will. Thank you. Thank you, Clarissa, for um, sharing your personal story as well as sharing your, your professional work on, on why you are campaigning and continuing to, to campaign on this issue. We're, we're fortunate today because we, we have a panel from a number of different communities, a number of different population groups, so that we can really begin to understand the depth and the breadth of this issue and how widespread it is. And with that, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to turn to Eustace and really ask you, why, why is sterilization an issue for transgender people? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would actually like to ask, to, to start this with a, with a question um, to, to all of you. Um, first of all, I want to I want for all of you to take a moment and think of a name that is the polar opposite of the name that you use. You have one in your mind? So a name that's completely different from the one that you have, the, the total opposite of that. Um, and then um, I, I would like to ask all of you, um, who of you has had to show your identity document in the last week at one point or another? That's pretty much all in the audience. Now imagine that that identity document um, shows that name that's polar opposite to who you are, um, that raises questions about whether or not who you are is, is actually the person on the identity document. And then imagine all the, all the cases where you have to show your identity document and where your identity is pulled into question because um, the name and the gender on your identity document do not match how you present. Um, for trans people, including myself, 
in order to be able to have an identity document that shows who we are, um, you have to often change your birth certificate, you have to change all other kinds of documentation. In many countries, that's not possible. But in those countries where it is possible, it often comes at the price of sterilization. Um, my government required for me, in order to be a, called Justus, to prove that I was sterilized. That is a pretty hefty price. And it is a price that I was willing to pay at the time. Because the, the opposite was just not a very practical or livable one. Imagine the next employer who was supposed to employ me, um, who gets a, a letter from me, who sees my picture, who invites me to an interview if I'm so lucky, and then sees all my identity documentation in, in a female name with female on it. Imagine going to the phone store, getting a phone. Imagine going to a hotel and registering. It's all these places that make it impossible for trans people to live um, productive and, digni uh, and, 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 and dignified lives uh, without those forms of identification. Having, having, those, um, having access to ID cards um, is not only um, giving people access to sign contracts, but it also gives people access to health care. It gives people access to insurance. It gives people access to jobs. Now, why do these laws have these requirements? I think some of it traces back to eugenics movement. Uh, it traces back to um, the idea that transgender people are out of their minds, out of our minds. Um, it traces back to um, a fear that children of transgender people could be transgender, and obviously that couldn't be a, possibly be a good thing. I think it is, but um, apparently many people don't think it is. But it also traces back to what happens when medical protocols are turned into law. In, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, by which time uh, medical transition through hormones and surgeries had provided enough trans people with um, um, with happier lives, with more authentic lives, more and more governments realized that they needed to also open avenues for transgender people to not just be happy and healthy, but also be productive and, and be part of society. Um, and that's when they turned to doctors and said, well, doctors tell us what makes a trans person a trans person, and the doctor said, okay, here's our, here's our protocol, this is what we do to these people at the end, just give them the sign of approval. And that's when those medical protocols, which were at the time what, um, what was the state of being, um, the state of affairs, were translated into law. And um, the law now requires either outright sterilization or it requires um, a certain fixed set of, um, of surgeries that lead to sterilization, such as genital rec reconstructive surgery. Um, not all trans people want or, or need those surgeries. Uh, many do. Um, either way, no government should force us to give up our rights to bear children in order to be recognized. Thank you. Thank you um, very much. We're, we're going to um, turn now to um, Andrea, and we've just heard about the specific dynamics of um, 
coerced sterilization, forced sterilization for transgender people. And um, I'm aware that you've done a lot of work in Colombia, and, and I think it's useful for us to hear uh, whether this is a similar practice uh, for women living with disabilities, and how uh, is stigma and discrimination of women with disabilities still part of current government uh, strategies to reduce population growth, or have we moved beyond that? Thank you, Malaya. Uh, at the clinic where I work, uh, we have had the opportunity to uh, provide legal representation and engage in political advocacy on behalf of the rights of people with disabilities in general. And um, in Colombia, as well as in many countries in the world, there is a legal structure that legitimizes uh, sterilization of people with disability because of uh, the legal capacity uh, norms in a country. So many countries have various forms of plenary guardianship that assign to a third party the legal uh, right to make decisions concerning patrimony, concerning health, concerning uh, living conditions of a person who's placed under a plenary guardianship. This impacts mostly people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. Um, with the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities that was um, passed in 2006 and has a very high ratification rate in the world, Colombia ratified it in 2011, um, that uh, mandates a complete shift in paradigm uh, for people with disabilities. Article 12 of the Convention mandates the full recognition of legal capacity of people with disabilities. Um, so, so the fact that the legal system validates and legitimizes uh, sterilization without the direct consent of the person being sterilized, uh, by, but by authorization of a judge and request of a family member, means that um, many people with disabilities are uh, both sterilized without knowing that they're being sterilized, there's no access to information in terms of what happens, and then uh, just as Justice was saying, prejudice and stereotypes about people with disabilities and their sexuality play a huge role in the way this is implemented. Um, so generally people with disabilities, especially people with intellectual disabilities, as, are regarded as asexual, as um, children throughout their lives, so they're forcibly infan infantilized, therefore in no need of learning about sexuality or uh, having access to information. Most of the services from the state are not accessible for people with disabilities. Information, public information to the public is not uh, available in accessible formats. And uh, plenary guardianship, just uh, also th I think it, as in the case of trans um, uh, people, has this origin in the eugenic movement. People with disabilities were sterilized massively during the Nazi regime in the United States, in California was where the model started, in Canada, in uh, Europe, and uh, it's also a legacy from Roman law uh, to displace the autonomy of a person with a disability to a third party. So that's a legacy that we're still, um, that we still have reflected in our legal systems, and you can see it everywhere in the way the law speaks about people with disabilities in terms of imbecile that, that still exists in many of the laws throughout Latin America, or uh, the gradation of disability in severe, profound, uh, that's also a way to medicalize the experience of people with disabilities. So these are aspects that are taken uh, by the law and that allow for a sterilization to happen. The other huge issue that we face is that it's not uh, documented uh, in the in the databases of the government. So we submitted a request to the government and the information we got is that between 2009 and 2011, 505 people with disabilities had been sterilized in Colombia. Um, 127 men, I'm sorry, 505 women with disabilities and 127 men with disabilities. Uh, and most of them in procedures independent of of cesarean section or, or pregnancy. So, and we've, then we have a lot of anecdotal information of stories of people with disabilities that are 
told by their parents they're going to be taken to the doctor. And then they come out uh, sterilized without ever knowing. Um, so this is an issue that has to be addressed both in terms of practice, but in terms, also in terms of uh, legal reform. Uh, because plenary guardianship is what allows this legitimation to happen and this normalization of the practice to happen. So in terms of the data, it's extremely hard to find and extremely hard to contact people who have been forcibly sterilized because uh, people with disabilities are placed in, uh, if they're sterilized, it usually means that they're placed in a very dependent situation and have um, not given the means to access resources or agency. And the other thing is that hundreds of people are uh, institutionalized throughout Colombia and many parts of the world. Uh, fortunately, there have been more reports about forced institutionalization of people, but then accessing people in institutions is also an extremely hard um, task. Um, yeah. <laughs> I th you know, the, the, the common theme emerging here shouldn't surprise anyone in the room of prejudice and stereotypes and people in communities that have been marginalized uh, by society and, and assumptions on sexuality. And I think that's um, uh, something that's very common to that. The, the second last speaker that we'll hear from Will, um, Camila will, will share with us, based on her work on sexual and reproductive health and rights and family planning, the dynamics of forced sterilization among the indigenous communities in Peru. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Malaya. Um, in the case of Peru, I think there are f uh, four core issues I want to highlight to, to understand the, the case of forced sterilization in Peru. The first one is the thing of autonomy and how sometimes public policies deny autonomy of vulnerable groups. And I think this is a key issue because in the, in the case of Peru, the forced sterilization were performed as part of the national planning uh, program and the national development agenda. But also after sterilizations, a, a woman that want to have a voluntary st sterilization now, they, this has been denied, as that is not also a violation of women and, and men autonomy. So I think the first thing is the, the thing of autonomy and how this is a nice to some vulnerable groups. The, the second issue uh, is, is the thing of uh, sometimes how the, some public policies and, and uh, development policies uh, are based on and prioritize the cost-effective uh, approach. So in the case of Peru, uh, uh, there was this uh, targets to, 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 to to, to decrease in the fertility rates and also to decrease maternal mortality, and uh, sterilization was a, a good measure to, to do that. Uh, without taking in consideration the lack of human resources, the, the poor health system, and uh, other issues that need to be worked. So all the thing of quality, all the thing of uh, power relation and the health uh, facilities were no work, uh, were denied, and this thing happens because of or a poorly cost-effective agenda. Um, a third feature is uh, the thing of uh, providing this free care or, uh, or, or, or poor uh, or, or policy focus on, on poor population. They say, okay, you are receiving this for free, so you have to be happy because this is for free for you, and please don't complain because this is, this is for free. And, and I think that is a problem when this is not uh, recognized that uh, poor people also have rights and uh, this is ideas of benefits in place of entitlements, and sexual and reproductive rights and sexual and reproductive services are part of, of women and men entitlements in, in Peru, and this was denied. So, so all, and also that justifies the mistreatment suffered by, by the people, because this is for free, so cheer up and just receive this, I know what is the best for you. And linked with this is the issue of the mistreatment that was performed against the people at the health facilities, and this shows Something that also the policies and these global targets were just ignored, the, the thing of the deep discrimination structures in, in Peru against indigenous people. And, uh, and because of the indigenous people were uh, lacking of access to, to, to health and also uh, 
the maternal mortality was higher among indigenous people. That you just put them, sterilize them, you mistreat them, you insult them, you tie them to the beds and, and perform physical abuse against this, this woman. So I think there are the, the thing of autonomy and pro poor uh, uh, policies that just ignore other structural issues as power dynamics and discrimination was key in the, in the case of, of Peru. Uh, Camila, I, th I think that was um, really valuable for us to hear because in, in the case that you described, it was um, action that which is very clearly sanctioned by the state in the, in the name of the development strategies which were happening at the time and in the name of cost-effective um, arguments. We're, we're going to turn now to the, the last speaker, um, Lydia, who um, for many years you led the Stop Torture in Healthcare campaign, which we're, we're turning now to kind of looking at some of the ways the communities and the activists have been brought together to raise awareness to stop this process. And I, uh, and I think um, turning to Lydia now to give us a little bit of a historical background on what we've done to date, and then maybe some insight around maybe how we can move together in the future to go uh, beyond the awareness and the advocacy and really work to, to stop this practice. Over to you, Lydia. To my fellow panelists for inviting me to join you and to all of you for coming to this session today. Um, as Malaya said, my name is Lydia Guterman and from 2009 to 2013, I led the campaign to stop torture in healthcare, which was a global effort of the Open Society Foundations in partnership with organizations around the world to increase government accountability for severe human rights abuses in healthcare settings, which uh, many of us know are often perpetrated against those that are most vulnerable and most in need of quality care. Forced and coerced sterilization was one of the focus issues of that campaign. And we also know from hearing from our panelists and from the work that many of you have done, um, seeing very, some familiar faces in the room, that work to document involuntary sterilization and to advocate against the practice started long before 2009, long before the campaign to stop torture in healthcare but was often very siloed with individual populations and individual constituencies documenting and advocating against forced sterilization for those within their own constituency. But the campaign during, during its, its years, a few years ago, offered really unique and groundbreaking opportunities for cross-constituency advocacy um, that hadn't been available to that point, especially at the global level. And I wanted to talk to you today about why I think that's important, uh, what was accomplished during that time with the help of many of you, um, some particular achievements and where I think that we can go from here, especially in the context of how things have gone at this particular CSW um, session over the last couple of weeks. So I'd like to suggest that cross-constituency advocacy on forced and coerced sterilization is particularly important for at least two reasons. Um, so as you've heard from the panelists, forced and coerced sterilization is perpetrated against seemingly very dissimilar populations for seemingly very unique reasons. Um, but the opportunities that were provided in the context of multi-constituency uh, consultation processes allowed for a space that hadn't existed previously for organizations and constituencies to talk with each other, to learn from each other, and to develop alliances, at least at the global level, that hadn't existed before. So you have you know, trans communities and advocates um, and people with intersex conditions learning from uh, Roma women and women with disabilities, you know, conversations that wouldn't naturally happen had there not unfortunately been the shared experience of a common abuse. Um, so that's the first reason, the forging of partnerships that didn't exist previously. Second, the statements and the outcome documents that resulted from those consultative, um, you know, multi-constituency processes, which, you know, let us tell you, the many of us that participated in those, they weren't always easy, um, and they certain were, certainly were fraught with disagreements, like any good, you know, consult consultative process is, but there was the opportunity for, for constituencies to talk across 
um, to talk with each other and to learn from each other. Um, in, with the catalyst of that being their experience with forced and coerced sterilization. But the outcome documents that resulted from those processes, a few of which I'll talk about in a second, were very comprehensive. Um, and when you have comprehensive documents that are able to make declaratory statements like only a woman herself can consent to a sterilization procedure, um, that encompasses all women, um, that doesn't say specifically women with HIV, specifically women with disabilities. There's power in those numbers, and a lot of this work did a very good job of balancing um, comprehensiveness with also an inclusion of particular circumstances under which the, bio, the, the rights of different groups are violated. Um, the more comprehensive the statements, the harder it is for states to get around them, you know, to find loopholes, to find exemptions for particular populations, or to develop separate standards for separate populations. Um, I'm thinking specifically about women with disabilities whose rights are often um, denied under the context of things like guardianship laws or substitute decision making. Um, when you have a declarative statement that only a person themselves can consent, that doesn't mean that person's guardian, that means that person themselves. Um, I think about it a lot, uh, sort of like the child's game Red Rover. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. We play that in the U.S. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a game where, you know, if you're on the same team, you stand next to each other and you loop arms um, and you create a strong wall. And the other team runs at you full force and tries to find the weakest link to break through. And I think before some of this cross-constituency advocacy, all of us on the same team were standing in a line, but our arms weren't linked. Um, and the campaign really provided opportunities for us to link arms um, and to provide a, a, a wall that's more difficult to break through. Um, and the question is, where do we go from there? We all know that the global work um, is only part um, of, the, of the answer, and the real difficult work starts when we try to translate that into the national level. Um, you know, we can speak maybe more specifically uh, about some of the particular uh, policies and statements that came out uh, during those years. Um, Malaya mentioned the 2011 International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics Guidelines on Female Contraceptive Sterilization. Uh, that was really the first cross-constituency um, advocacy opportunity. Um, let's be clear that it is not inclusive. It does not include trans and intersex persons, and in that way it, it, it does not meet the full expectations. Um, but those were supposed to be indeed guidelines on female contraceptive sterilization, and that's why they stayed where they were. Those are the strongest um, with respect to the, the provision of rights for uh, women and children with disabilities um, and are in line with the CRPD, whereas some others aren't. Um, and also perhaps you know, to wrap up uh, something very also important that came out of that and in the, uh, the 2014 uh, WHO and our agency statement is that all of our efforts to end forced and coerced sterilization must be balanced with a respect for full access to voluntary sterilization for all that need it. Um, you know, our, our fight against forced sterilization is ardent. We can't forget that there are people who would like to have sterilization. They deserve to have sterilization without undue barriers. Um, and that's what full and, you know, full implementation of SRHR in this context <coughs> means. So thanks very much. Thanks very much. We, there, there's a few um, questions, that, uh, open questions that we have for the panel. I want to encourage you, Sophia, have you handed out? Uh, so if people do have um, questions, please send them up as early as possible because what Sophie's trying to do is, is group them and uh, you, uh, in a way that we can kind of go through them. So if you have additional questions, um, please uh, forward them. The, it, the first open question that, that um, I have uh, to the panel, um, I think we've actually heard quite a lot about um, from the different uh, uh, constituencies on why the practice continues and what the common features are but what the very different features are for that practice. I wanted to hear a bit more from your, your own work and on what do you feel have been the most successful strategies. So I wanted to kind of jump ahead 
so that we can really kind of focus this discussion on uh, the way forward by looking at what strategies in your own work do you think ha have been successful and that maybe we should be building on. Uh, so it's open to the panel, whoever would like to start. Lydia? And please just keep the, the questions, uh, the answers succinct, thanks. Well, from the perspective of somebody who's worked primarily at the global level, um, I think that global advocacy should always be informed by the local. Um, and for you know those of us who do spend a lot of time in UN meetings, it's, it can be easy to, to be disconnected from what's happening at the local level. Um, but again, just that everything about the most successful parts of the, the consultations that have happened at um, global level have had the meaningful participation of people who um, have either uh, directly experienced forced and coerced sterilization um, or have been involved in documenting the practice um, or other redress you know, mechanisms. So um, there's a plug for those of us working at the global level to make sure that we're always grounded um, and informed by what's going on at the local level. Yeah, I think in, um, in the case of, of trans people and um, I believe also in the case of intersex people, it's been really important to name those practices um, sterilization um, and to name those laws, um, laws that coerce sterilization laws that require sterilization and, and to put that name on it. Um, when I started my work in, um, in the trans community, when I, when I transitioned myself uh, in 2003, um, and I, I started to talk to other trans people about, about these laws and these requirements, um, people were like, yeah, but that's, that's just the way it is, you know, um, that's just part of the program. You, you sign up for this program, so you sign up for this. Um, and only when I started to talk about, no, but this is, this is a sterilization requirement. Our government actually requires us to be sterilized. And that people started to think, oh, well, yeah, that's actually true. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe that isn't right. Maybe they shouldn't do that. And, and maybe, uh, um, maybe just because um, I want to have a body that looks a certain way or I want to... Um, have a certain kind of procedure or surgery doesn't mean that every single trans person in the world will want to have the same. Um, and, um, and people starting to recognize that yes, there were quite a lot of transgender people who have children, um, who want to have children, who may want to have children at some point in the future. So I think, I think naming it uh, by what it is uh, was a really important step and was also a really important way of talking to governments about it because before, also governments were saying, yeah, but these are medical protocols, we just follow what the doctors say. Um, now, they, now they realize that they actually have a role in this um, that is not in line with the uh, uh, human rights conventions that they have signed. Um, Theresia, successful strategies? So uh, what, what we did uh, is document the experiences of women living with HIV and their uh, forced and co-sterilization instances. And this sort of supported our advocacy work because you, there is no advocacy without evidence. But having said that, uh, also litigation, like uh, there are so many other cases that have been taken to court in Southern Africa. Currently, there is a case that is going on in Kenya. And so these are some of the successful um, interventions that we have been able to accomplish. But above all, the issue of mobilizing women living with HIV and educating them on their sexual reproductive health and rights was sort of very successful. Why? Because when we are reaching out to women, when we were documenting their experiences, most of the women who were forced and coerced did not realize that this is a human rights violation. And this was very touching to us because we now needed to go to the basics and start talking about what constitutes a violation, what is sexual reproductive health and rights, what is consent. And that was very powerful. And now women, as they go, even though it is not on a broader scale, but when they go to the facility, then they are able to negotiate and say, this is my right. I need more time to, to make this decision. Um, so we've engaged in various types of strategies, both local, regional, and international. Uh, first, in the, in the cases that we um, provide orientation for, in the case of people with disabilities, it's usually their parents that request uh, the sterilization. 
So it's not a question of uh, it would be a bad strategy to just antagonize parents as human rights violators, and that's it. We need to engage in a conversation about why uh, that's the route that they are choosing and what does that mean for their children. And so we, it, whenever we receive a call, and we receive uh, quite a few every day, uh, we sit down and ask, okay, what's um, happening? Usually uh, what we have found is that it's health professionals or legal professionals who advise the parents to make sure that they sterilize their child. Also, uh, institutions uh, that, are, that hold children with disabilities, we've found cases in which families are advised to have their children sterilized uh, and can start considering sterilization when they're three. So, um, uh, and the reasons why they're told that they should sterilize their children usually is to prevent sexual abuse. That's the argument that it says. So when we start a conversation about, so how do you think that sterilizing your child would protect them from sexual abuse? Then they start thinking a little more and realize that it's indeed a, a risk factor to, um, to be sterilized because in the vast majority of cases of sexual abuse against people with disabilities, the perpetrator is a person that belongs to the circle of care of the person of care. So that's one way in which we've engaged, because as I mentioned, accessing or having direct contact with people, with um, women with disabilities who are sterilized is extremely hard. We've also created alliances with self-advocates and women with uh, intellectual disabilities who are not sterilized themselves, but because they've been able to be empowered through, through their families, but who engage in advocacy on behalf of other women with disabilities who they know of or are friends with in other institutions. So we, um, we, over the course of two years, we also created an alliance with um, an organization of families with intellectual disabilities, an organization of people with psychosocial disabilities, Pro Familia, which is the largest uh, sexual and reproductive health care provider in, in Colombia and one of the largest in Latin America, um, and us to do a joint project involving um, education, a program uh, on sex education for youth with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities, uh, international advocacy, and as a result, we submitted a shadow report before CEDO that resulted in specific recommendations. And also, um, on a, in a, it, it resulted in a report about the findings of this project, because as I said, the data is one of the hardest things to find. Uh, also, uh, there's a law that is trying to implement the Convention on Disabilities in Colombia, and we managed to include sexual and reproductive health in it. Uh, and we continuously engage in policy advocacy with the Ministry of Health, the National Institute of Health, to provide data about the procedures that are happening. And we, the most recent, uh, we did a thematic uh, hearing at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights on sexual and reproductive rights of people with disabilities. I think it was the first one that ever happened there, and um, recently submitted a part of, participated in a part of a shadow report before uh, the Committee Against Torture um, be, uh, during the Columbia Review. So we've engaged in multiple types of strategies. Okay. Um, Camila. Um, okay, in the, in the case of Peru, I mean, uh, the way that uh, I think the, the work from the Ombudsman and, and Julia Tamayo, that they make research on this and then try to document the cases, was key to, to stop the policy. Um, so I think the documenting and, and trying to, to document some strong cases, because this, in the way that these sterilizations are performed, that doesn't allow you to have, and to, to, to have enough evidence for all the cases. But uh, they they managed to, to, to build some good cases to, to show to the authorities and, and they managed to stop the, the practice. One of the cases was uh, sent to the Inter-American Human Rights uh, Commission and, uh, and, and, and with that uh, the government agreed to, to change the policy and, and, to, and to adopt the recommendations made by the Ombudsman office. So, uh, so I think the documentations and, and to try to, to find a good and strong cases is, is key in, in this case, type of cases. Thank you. Um, it's, it's hard to attempt to summarize, but I'll just list some, because there is some commonalities. 
the meaningful participation of communities affected and mobilization of those communities, um, looking at the laws, naming it by what it is. Uh, a lot of success uh, found by the documentation and the litigation going very clearly and specifically, and um, the education of women and the trans community on, on their sexual and reproductive health and the, the rights that, that they have. We have a number of, and I'm sure there's many other successful uh, strategies that I, I didn't quite, I didn't grasp them all. We have a number of comments from the, the floor. In an area where we felt that it's been um, tackled by this set of questions, apologies uh, in the interest of time, but the panelists will be available afterwards if you'd like to speak with them um, uh, specifically. Um, we, we had a question which I, I thought, Camila, had been um, dealt with by your intervention, which is, and, and people have appalling handwriting, by the way, I'll just say. <laughs> um, what about sterilization for population control in developing countries? Now, we just want one panelist to address this from the, the human rights perspective and from what's in the... Uh, international laws and, and policies. Can, and so not everybody has to address it. I just want one panelist to be able to give some background on that, and I think you're probably best suited. Um, uh, I mean, first, I mean, sterilization, as, as Malaya said at, at, the begin, at the beginning, is the most common modern contraception method. It's not that the use of, of female sterilization or the access to female sterilization is, is wrong. The thing is, again, it's a thing of autonomy. So if you're going to develop and you're going to put a target of sterilization as part of a development policy, then you have to, to think first, I mean, what is this going to create in terms of how this is going to be delivered? And, um, and then the issue of, of population control is, I mean, and again, in, in the case of Peru, this was performing in the, in the second half of, of the 90s, but Last year, you can remember the case of in India that has been again and again and again reported in the 70s, in the 80s, and in the 90s, and, and, and last year. So we, we have to think which kind of policy we, we, we want. And it's because these people is poor, they don't have any right to decide on their own bodies. So, okay, we can have this aim and goal to, and, and uh, all these ideas that if, if better to have less children for your own development and that, okay. But in the way that we achieve that, is, 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 that is the, the issue. We are going to force people because they are poor, they don't have access to education, they don't have access to a lot of things, and that in a way is a sound of the determinants of they have a lot of children, and we are going to tackle that, or we are going to have the fast track and just sterilize them and stop with the problem of too many poor people in this country. So I think it's the way that we design the policies and, and how much we are going to respect the autonomy of, of this population. Uh, thank you very much. We, we have another question, I think, from your experience, and, and it's great that we, we have people on the panel of concrete experience in the, uh, in the countries. One is really looking at spreading uh, education and information uh, among women, and how, how, how can we do that better or work with governments to do that better given the diversity of languages, the marginalization of these women, and specifically, how do we include young girls? We get just one person from the, the panel who can think of, do we have successful strategies where we've had widespread kind of education campaigns uh, dealing with the multiple and the diversity of populations in a given country? So uh, ICW has, uh, and other networks have been in a position to, to reach out to, to many more women, but of course not to all uh, communities that needs education on forced and coerced sterilization. And so one of the challenges that we are facing is the capacity of the networks to reach out to, to, to many more people, to many more women, and actually educate them on, on, on their sexual reproductive health and rights. So um, 
and and one of the things is that there have been a, a, a shift, especially in in resources from other from and when you look at uh, at HIV, it has been mostly about biomedical and mm -hmm. and you know that and so less on on other aspects of of HIV interventions and thus limiting the the networks in the amount of work they need to do and whom they can reach. Sorry, just one quick note that I know that in, in Kenya GEM and some of the other organizations, there's multiple things to do education on. One is about sterilization and every person's right to do to have sterilization in a way that is free, full, and informed. But you also have access and the right to access to your medical records and other information about your bodies um, and about the the healthcare that has been performed or forced upon you. And in many places, um, redress for these violations has really been stymied by the fact that um, women have gone to demand their health records um, and they're either told that they don't exist or that they're not theirs, that they are the property of the state um, if these, you know, if these sterilizations were performed in a government facility. Um, so the, the education is not just about consent and the procedure itself, but everything um, that surrounds the procedure and uh, care in a health facility overall. for a specific question directed at uh, Eustace. What is the message you have for religious people who continue to persecute trans people? What would you want religious people to do or say to support the trans community? Thank you. Um, I, I struggled with this question a little bit because, um, because it, 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 um, it sort of assumes that all religious people are the same. And um, and I think that is absolute, that is not the case. Um, for for every person who uses their religion to um, be hateful to another person, there is another religious person who does the opposite and and spreads the word of love. Um, I I think um, um, I think that that. Um, Pretty much every religion that I know of um, is is rooted in a in a deep belief in humanity and and in the diversity of of humanity and um, the love that um, the God or deity has for all of us. And I think that is a very good starting point to um, to understand each other as, as humans and to um, um, to be loving to each other. So, so I think it's um, I think it's dangerous when when whenever you whenever you use a large group of people and put them in one uh, in one group and say all people in this group think this and all people in that group think that, and I think it's hurtful to uh, to uh, um, to both religion and to religious people. Thank you. Finally, somebody um, or. Somebody wrote more of a, a comment, and it it led to something that we, as the panel, had wanted to hear from the the floor. And somebody wrote, uh, in Mexico, forced sterilization is happening too. It's done to people who attend social security, the poor, the middle, low class. They don't know about it. Government doesn't tell. What can we do? Specifically, it is a problem that many aren't aware of, injustice uh, because of their status. And so one of the questions I think the panel wanted to hear from the floor itself was, um, are there instances in, in your community or in your work that, that you're aware of where this practice is, and, and can we hear very short interventions uh, from yourself other than the, the case of Mexico? Because I think it's important for us that we start also documenting and becoming aware and investigating where the practice might be happening and we're not aware of. Does anyone have experiences on this particular topic? This isn't open questions to the panel. It's very targeted that, they, that they'd like to share. Woman in the red. In fact, it, for the disability group, it is occurring in the United States. Uh, and customarily, the physicians will require an order from the guardianship court 
uh, in order to proceed with the, the process. Part of the question that arises in, in the context of a woman is whether a LARC will do the a long acting contraceptive would be an adequate, uh, less uh, disabling uh, response to the situation that the parents are trying to, to protect against. With men, part of the concern that's expressed by the parents is unwarranted paternity suits or paternity suits under a situation where the, the ward is simply unable to support offspring or care for offspring. So it's a much more complex question, I think, in that instance. Great. Sorry, can I, I have people introduce themselves when they speak as well? I'm sorry, I'm Teresa Collette. I'm a professor of law at the University of St. Thomas. Please. Um, and any other interventions on this specific topic? Please. Uh, Susanna Phillips, I was previously with the Center for Reproductive Rights, where we brought a case to the Inter-American Commission on behalf of a woman. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, Susanna Phillips, previously with the Center for Reproductive Rights, where we uh, documented the um, sterilization of women living with HIV in Chile um, and released a report around the stigma and discrimination that it accompanies that in the um, area of sexual and reproductive health care broadly and filed a case in the Inter-American Commission on behalf of a woman who was forcibly sterilized because she was HIV positive. examples or cases that uh, they're aware of. The, the person who wrote on Mexico, were they uh, happy to introduce themselves? Hello, I'm Cecilia. I'm from Mexico and I'm 20 years old. The last question we have for the, the panel that came from the floor and then we have a wrap-up question for the panel is, um, and I think there's, uh, it's directed specifically in terms of the country organizing, I'm, I'm going to guess. Can the panelists speak about the cross-movement organizing given the range of groups uh, affected by forced or coerced sterilization? So how are you, for instance, Suricia, able to reach out to other groups in, in Kenya and organize and create a, a movement in this respect. Anyone can address that question. Did you want to start? Yeah. Uh, for, for a long time, as someone mentioned, we, we've been working in, in, in silos and each group has been addressing the, the issues of sexual reproductive health and rights violations in a, in a different way. And so there's need now like for the different communities to come together. And as the community of women living with HIV, we have uh, that uh, desire. And we also want to merge with other uh, groups and other communities so that we can address the issue together. One of the things is working with other like-minded organizations, the women's movement. Also, we want to, and something that we know that is missing, we, we are asking where is religion. We want them, as they speak loudly about other issues that they are not favorable of, we also know that they would not want uh, women living with HIV to be forcefully uh, sterilized, and we want them to be on board and speak against the, the vice. So we are looking forward to, to certain groups and other organizations working on the same and uh, so that we can address the issue together and end the vice. In the case of Colombia, I think one of a very successful alliance has been between people with disabilities and trans uh, folks facing uh, a sterilization. Um, and the other um, that has been is dialogue with um, mainstream, more mainstream women's rights organization to incorporate uh, the perspective of disability in their advocacy work and uh, recently, as I mentioned, with more mainstream human rights organizations that are working on, on torture in Colombia because of the armed conflict, but also can incorporate the conceptualization of sterilization as a form of torture into their work. So that has been successful work uh, in alliance that we have been able to engage in. Thank you. Um, is this? Yeah, I think... Um I think for for me it's 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 been always so powerful to to be able to 
um, to listen to the stories of, um, of other people who have had similar experiences um, for very d different reasons and sometimes uh, for very similar reasons. And whenever, whenever I, f I see those similarities, um, it's really helpful to, um, to understand where, um, where the, 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 the target that uh, many of our communities are experiencing is coming from and, and, and how that works out in, in different or very, sometimes very similar ways. Um, also, the, um, the litigation and, and the casework and the, um, the legal framework that has been established over um, the last century or so around this um, by, by all kinds of communities has been really helpful in, um, and, and really useful for trans people as well. For example, um, just last week, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that um, Turkey could not require sterilization as a precondition for people who wanted to transition medically. Um, so, um, and, and that case is rooted in, in a long um, series of cases um, at, the, at the European Court for Human Rights um, on all kinds of aspects of sterilization. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to direct a, a final question to the panel, um, which is really around the recommendations going forward. So we've moved quite far ahead in, in crossing boundaries with communities, organizing uh, together, raising awareness, bringing some key uh, cases to court and, and supporting them. So, so what's next? How, how, do, how do we move forward? How do we, what are the recommendations that you would have that as an international community we work together on these issues? Does anyone want to start? Lydia? Start at this end. So I'll, I'll keep my global advocacy hat on for the final statement, and I think that I would like to make it CSW specific. Um, you know, as feminists, as representatives of organizations that are here to support the, the full implementation of human rights for all genders, um, we've always really held up CSW as a place where we could come to participate, to have our voice at the table, and be part of the process of negotiating laws and policies that impact um, our rights. This year at CSW, we have been shut out of that process, and I think that we have to demand better. Um, the, everything is being discussed without us. Um, forced sterilization is happening to us, it's happening to people at this table and others around, and the, around the room. If we're shut out of venues like CSW that have always been a place um, where our voice was heard, then fights against forced sterilization are going to be increasingly harder. So um, I'd say we, let's balance our specific work on this issue with the realization that um, the doors are closing around us um, and make sure that we're always at the table um, fighting for um, the full implementation of our sexual health and rights. Great recommendation. I'm going to ping pong here. Um, I think the, that in, in the context of the post-2015 development agenda, it's, it's important to, like, to think more about the, the risk of national targets that are not sensible to structural factors and also to the situation of vulnerable population. But also it's important to, to think again on these targets that, that go to maternal health without taking into consideration sexual and reproductive rights, empowerment. Uh, I think the London submit some years ago just ignore the things of rights and empowerment and is uh, only to family planning without this rights-based agenda. And, and also the thing of population control and climate change, and you know, okay, all that's okay, but again, where is empowerment, where is where are the rights of, and, and what that, if that agenda, we are going to introduce that or not. Now, uh, I'm just going to pick up on something on that, because the point there was you have to work within your national delegations. You have to, in order to influence those targets within the SDGs, you have to <coughs> demand that of, of your national delegations that they're going on beyond things like maternal health and, and putting in the rights and the empowerment in those targets which are being discussed next week. 
right? So, in ter and they'll be discussed again, but, but it's really a call to you to work within the context of your national delegations. A number at CSW that you thought would come out strongly, like the European bloc, were completely silent on these issues. Uh, I'm going to hand now to Andrea. Um, I think uh, also the regional alliances for us have been uh, very useful, and we work in collaboration with groups in Peru, in Mexico, in Argentina, and uh, I think that that has proven to also advance uh, at the more regional level the, uh, the rights uh, yeah, of people with disabilities, and no country in the world to date has fully implemented Article 12 of the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, and I think that that's a momentum to really push for um, all-encompassing laws that respect full autonomy of people with disabilities. Thank you. Um, you this way forward, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? I think the, um, the putting it down in one or two words is, is choice and self-determination. Um, and, and putting the emphasis on choice and self-determination. De and, and I think um, um, that's really what, what, what this all boils down to me for, is, is the, the right of, um, um, of people to choose what, what their body is, is going to look like, what their body is capable of, and um, how they want to um, fill in that choice. Thank you. Um, the last word to the person who started the panel, <coughs> Teresia, where, where should we as a, as a global community working on these issues, where should we go next? What's our next steps? Now, I'm thinking that the process of litigation is quite uh, tedious for women living with HIV and really focusing on how to support women living with HIV psychosocially is, is quite key for, for the network and so like setting aside uh, budgets for that. But I also wanted to say that there is need for comprehensive advocacy that benefit women living with HIV and women in general and the communities that we've had today here. There is need for women living with HIV to be involved in decision making, in policy formulations, in laws in their country and programs, not only here at the CSW when we come to New York, but also when you go back at home. But finally, I would not leave here without saying that as we talk about Beijing 20 plus, we can't leave HIV behind. As we talk, as we talk about post-2015 agenda, we must know that as women living with HIV, we are living and we can see the challenges and violations that are happening today. So HIV and AIDS must be in the agenda and women living with HIV must be included in this agenda. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a powerful close from the, the HIV community because it, uh, we need to re-energize and, and put the, the, the movement is still there, the community organizing is still there, but the political will is really falling off the, the radar and we need to all come together on that agenda as well. I want to thank you all uh, for coming and those who stayed till the end of uh, this panel. And I want to especially start, uh, thank the panelists and I think we should give them all a round of applause for sharing their stories and work.